Well, thanks, Alana, for joining us today. Um, today, we have Alana Hernandez, the Executive Vice President of Business Affairs and Operations of Team Sports for Wasserman. Um, thanks for joining us. Let's start off with just asking you, you know, what are the basic things a student athlete should look for when approached with an NIL deal from a legal standpoint? Oh, gosh, there's, there's several things. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit terrifying when, it, when a student athlete's thinking about a contract and they don't have any legal experience. But there are a handful of things that I would say to really look out for. Um, the first and maybe one of the most important is the concept of exclusivity. So think about you're entering into a deal with a brand that produces a particular type of product. What does that actually mean? Does that mean that you can't do a deal with any other company during the time period that the deal is into effect? Or does it just mean that you can't do a deal with certain companies that are competitive? So really kind of thinking about what entering into a deal with this particular brand actually means. Um, you also want to make sure you understand the specific services that are required of you. A lot of times it's going to be attend an appearance, sign some autographs, post some things on social, but just make sure you agree with the way that they're actually written in the contract. Um, sometimes uh, you might have an understanding of what you're supposed to do, and then it's written in a way that's a little bit different. So make sure you agree with it and that you're willing to fulfill the requirements as they're actually drafted, including the date, the time, the location, things of that nature. Um, and also make sure that you understand pay payment guarantee. Obviously, that's going to be one of the most important things to a student athlete when going into a deal is, am I going to get paid for the services that I actually perform? And ideally, there's not going to be any way that a brand can get out of paying once you've signed this deal. Um, and I think, you know, that might be a little bit obvious, but sometimes um, things are written in a way that you perform the services, the brand decides they don't really want to use the services and they terminate the agreement. Well, that's not really fair because you've performed everything. Or if you offer them exclusivity and you turn down a deal with another company, then that's something of value that you might want to consider and also make sure that you can get paid for, for the time that you put into it. Um, approval rights. So do you have the right to tell a brand that you don't like a certain image that they're going to use or they're going to post? Uh, you prefer some other image that, that they post? You prefer they describe your bio in a different way? So approval rights over how a brand is going to um, describe how they're working with you is really important. Make sure you understand the termination rights for both you and for the third party that you're entering into a deal with. It really shouldn't be easy for a brand to get out of a deal. And if and if they do exit the deal, then you want to make sure, like I said earlier, that you do get paid for all the work you've put in. And then also make sure it's not overly complicated. Um, if for whatever reason you feel like the deal doesn't work for you, um, you should be able to exit that deal in that case. And then the last thing I would say is dispute resolution. So make sure you understand where and how disputes are able to be resolved. The overarching co consideration for deciding when to get an agent is, is it going to be valuable to get an agent over all of the, you know, the, the compensation that you're going to have to pay? So honestly, it's like when it becomes too challenging to manage your NIL endeavors, for example, you likely are receiving direct requests from brands. So are you receiving too many requests from them that it's not it's too much of your time to spend? Um, are the requests for your services too complex? So maybe they're long-term deals. There could be multiple service requests. Uh, perhaps the compensation terms involve things like equity or royalties, and, and those are a little bit complicated and you are, don't feel like you're an expert at those sorts of things. Um, or maybe you don't have the time to negotiate the contract terms. So is it going to be a little bit challenging for you to kind of do this for every single deal that comes forward? In that case, it might be helpful to get an agent. Um, I'd also say, you know, do you have time to dedicate toward like figuring out whether you can actually fulfill your NIL obligations? So, and you'll see when you see contracts that there's a lot of different things that they're going to want you to do. And so having somebody to make sure that the post is made when they request the post to be made, or you show up on time, you have the right car service, your flights are taken care of, all of those things um, an agent can really help you navigate. 
And then do you want somebody to just dedicate a lot of time to source NIL opportunities for you? And so you're probably getting a lot yourself, but if you think that you can have more, then you might want somebody out there pounding the pavement to find um, opportunities for you. But at the end of the day, it all has to be cost effective. So ultimately it has to make sense to pay the agent for all of these services in, in connection with the you know money that you're going to get. You don't want to be out of pocket and not, you know, having money at the end of the day because you've then paid the agent. For sure. What questions do you recommend student athletes ask when interviewing agents? The most important question probably is what is your prior experience representing athletes and student athletes in particular? And so with this question, you're really hoping to get a sense of, you know, how many contracts the agent has negotiated in the past? What are the types of athletes that they've represented in the past? whether any current or former clients are similar to you such that they really know how to market you, whether the agent has any connections in the industry that might be valuable in the work that they that you want them to do for you. And if there isn't a lot of prior NIL specific negotiation experience, then maybe you ask the question, what do you think makes you uniquely qualified to source and negotiate NIL contracts or opportunities on my behalf? And so these could be things like the agent has represented entertainers or they've represented um, other clients in a similar respect that aren't student athletes, um, but maybe they have strong relationships in the location in which you're, you are located and, and that could be valuable to you. Um, you might want to ask for specific examples of prior work and specific clients they've worked with just so you can get an idea of, of what they've done in the past. Um, and also, you want to make sure that, you know, once you're interviewing an agent, you're likely at a point where, you know, you, you have too much coming in to your, you know, DMs or, or people are reaching out to you and you just don't have time to manage it. Um, but you might want to know, like, what is the agent going to be able to do for you that you can't already do for yourself? So hopefully they're not just going to sit there and take the deals that are coming in directly to you. Hopefully they're actually going to able, be able to add additional value to what's already coming in. So you might want to ask, like, are you going to be out there proactively trying to find NIL opportunities for me? And what are you going to do to make that happen? You might want to understand, you know, what in the contract negotiation process or the deal negotiation process can they do to add value for those deals that do come to you directly. So you might get a deal that's, uh, you know, one social post for $700. Well, maybe you bring in an agent, they understand the market, they understand what other athletes are getting paid, maybe they can get you $1,000 instead. So the hope is that the agent is going to be able to add value. And then also you want to make sure that the agent can provide other services to you outside of just pure contract sourcing and negotiation. So you ask, what are the other things that are going to be offered to me if I were to sign with your agency? You're going to want to know who's going to be on your team. So are you going to speak with this particular agent? If you call or if you text, are they going to pick up or is it going to be someone else? And you want to make sure that you have a rapport with whoever is going to be doing the work on your behalf. It's also a good idea to ask how familiar the agent is with NCAA regulations, state laws just related to NIL and school regulations. Um, there's lots of nuances and things are changing frequently, as you know. So it's really important that whoever is representing you has a good understanding of all of those different um, assets. And um you know, it's not a bad idea to ask if the agent has ever been disciplined related to their profession. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are trying to take advantage of student athletes and you want to make sure you're you're going to work with somebody who's reputable, who has a good reputation. And then the final thing I would say is just, you know, make sure you ask for a copy of the representation agreement so that you can review it and provide comments that you don't want them to just kind of send you a DocuSign that you can't then forward to somebody else to take a look. And really, you want to understand basic, you know, terms in the contract. So how long is the term um, of the representation with the agent? What's the fee structure? Is the agreement exclusive? How can you terminate the agreement? And what are the dispute resolution provisions that are uh, within the agreement? Is there questions that they can ask to really understand how many deals or if they're going to provide the service that they're actually saying they do? Yeah, I mean, it's that's a challenge, I think, in, in all the situations as to how much or whether the agent's actually going to, to proactively look for new deals. Um, 
I think that could be written in the contract or in the representation agreement to have language that's, you know, the agent will reasonably um, and in good faith, you know, source deal, you know, go out and talk to parties to source deals on my behalf. You can think of something like that. Um, but I think the real value, even if a lot of the deals are coming directly to the athlete, is what the agent can do with those deals. So even if it's not increasing the, the value of the deal, but if the agent is really taking care of all the logistics in terms of the athlete servicing the deal is the one that's communicating with the brand so the athlete doesn't have to do that. Those are things of value that are, are not necessarily putting more money in the athlete's pocket, but it's actually more time for the athlete to then maybe go do other deals. Um, so I think you have to kind of think about it holistically as to what are all the things that are incorporated into doing an NIL deal and actually executing it? And how many of those things can the agent do? And are they going to promise to do all those things? I feel like that covered also the what services can an agent provide us in athlete, but are there anything else that you would recommend in terms of um, just giving a scope of what an agent can provide for an athlete? Could you maybe just like high level? Sure. So the obvious ones are going to be sourcing NIL opportunities. So proactively going to search for them, um, negotiating NIL contracts for student athletes. So that would be the business terms, but then also a lot of agents um, or agencies have in-house lawyers where they can negotiate the legal terms as well. And that's going to be incredibly important because um, like we mentioned before, the, all of the contract terms that you need to be aware of uh, that could just be drafted in a way that's confusing. Well, if you have somebody who is really seeing a lot of this, both at the amateur student athlete level, as well as the professional level, you at least have somebody who knows how to navigate and negotiate the terms in a way that's fair. Um, so those are the two biggest things, but there's other, a lot of other things that I think agents can do for student athletes, including, you know, assisting with, ideating and managing other revenue generating um, business opportunities. So let's say you're interested in creating a podcast or working on a documentary or other content development opportunities. A lot of agents are well positioned to be able to either help you do that themselves or introduce you to the people that might be able to do that um, sort of as like a business manager. Uh, some student athletes have launched product lines or have participated in other licensing opportunities. Agents are really great at helping to, again, make those kinds of connections that maybe you wouldn't know how to make yourself. Um, if you want to build an event, so like a 5K charity race, or you want to um, have another kind of youth uh, development camp or something like that, agents are really skilled at helping you do things like that as well. Um, I think one of the biggest things that maybe gets overlooked and doesn't get talked about a lot is just really understanding what your market value is. So you might get a deal and maybe you can negotiate a little bit more money yourself, but do you really know if that's how much those services are worth or how much you are worth as compared to other athletes in a very similar position um, with the same sort of engagement rates and followers. It's really hard to know a lot of that um, without having somebody that's an expert in the space. And so I think agents are really helpful at guiding athletes in that direction. Um, and then I think just, you know, in general, elevating yourself in the marketplace. So a lot of agents have the ability to help on um, creative elements. So logo creation, branding strategies, understanding PR and social media, and just really all of the things that come with marketing yourself and being out there in public and creating yourself as a brand, uh, agents are able to help with that. Um, I'd also say like just fulfilling your contract obligations. Um, you know, there's a lot that comes along with actually servicing a deal and executing a deal. So agents can make that a lot, bit, a lot easier for you as well. And then just understanding and making sure you comply with NIL regulations. A lot of brands are very new to this space. They've never worked with athletes at all, let alone student athletes. And their contracts can be written in a way that um, violates you know, NCAA regulations and they don't know it. And if you're not looking for that, you might not know it. So having somebody who is aware of what the regulations are, constantly keeping track of what they should or should not be doing in contracts, and then making sure that the contracts are actually reflective of what should be in there is really important. 
Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, agents have great relationships with people. And once you start making a little bit of money, um, it's probably great to have a financial advisor or financial planner. So an agent can make those connections and introduce you to um, a few people to, you know, talk through and, and interview for that sort of a, a position for you. What are common pay structures for an agent? Um, I'd say more often than not, agents will take a, um, percentage of the gross compensation earned from NAL deals. And traditionally, this is probably in the range of 15 to 20% um, for the standard NIL contract that actually pays compensation. If um, an agent's representing an athlete and everybody knows 99% of the work that is going to be done is really barter contracts, so product-based, um, you might get a car for, you know, licensing your NIL to a dealership, or you'll go and sign some products and you'll get free products in return. So some in those cases, maybe the agent will have an hourly fee charge just for reviewing and negotiating the deal or, or maybe for servicing the deal. So you, you might see a little bit of a that, but that's not really the norm. I would say the norm is probably the 15 to 20% on the deal. Um, and I would say just in terms of looking through um, the way that agents are going to charge fees, just make sure that you're not looking at a contract that is going to charge you 15% for your future earnings for the next 25 years. Um, be careful of that. As I know some student athletes have, have seen that, some professional athletes have entered into contracts like that, but um, that's not the standard way of, of agents getting paid. And so I would, I would try to, as much as possible to stick to that 15 to 20%. I was just going to say, are there anything that are uncommon pay structures for an agent that you've heard of or seen? Um, that one is the worst. I would say just, um, <laughs> percentage of, of, of future earnings for your entire career, including, you know, if you were to go professional or if you were to, were to become, you know, a Hollywood actor or something like that, that's not fair. That's not standard. Um, I would also make sure that the fees are not in perpetuity for a particular brand. You know, let's say the, the agent introduces you to brand X and you work with that brand for the next 25 years. Well, you know, they, and the agents aren't doing any work, then that's probably not as common, um, you know, as pay structure and, and probably wouldn't be something that I, I think you should sign on to. Um, but just make sure 15 to 20% for the deals that they help you negotiate during the period that they're working for you. And, you know, that's, I think, part of pretty standard. Jumping over to the collectives conversation, do you have any, um, what are some risks with collective agreements and how should a student athlete navigate an overall collective agreement? I'd say one of the biggest risks is that often these contracts don't really reflect um, what your market value is today and maybe what your market value might be at the end of the collective agreement. So you might have a collective agreement going in as a freshman and it's you know, last for as long as you are participating um, within a particular school or something like that. Well, let's say your followers increase by 500%. You are more active on social media. You've done a lot of big, you know, national deals and, and you have really have a lot of visibility. Well, your market value a year later is going to be a lot higher than it was when you first entered into that deal. And so just making sure you have ways for that collective agreement to increase the value um, as your marketability has increased. And I think that's a little bit challenging and, and sometimes people aren't thinking about it from that perspective. So like I said, agents are really helpful in, in trying to help you navigate through things like that. Another thing I would say is be a be careful of exclusivity. So remember that collective agreements are not agreements with a specific brand. They will um, introduce you to help you do deals with third party brands, but they're not with, you're not doing a deal with a specific brand. So if you do a deal with a collective and they have a concept of exclusivity, well, make sure it doesn't apply to all of the unnamed third party brands, you know, at the time that you're doing the deal, because you don't know that you agree to that right now. Um, you want to make sure if there's exclusivity at all, it's just vis-a-vis -vis one collective versus another collective and not, like I said, all the brands that they could potentially do deals with. Um, and also, you know, in the same sort of 
vein, you know, third party protections, the agreements often are collective will make sure that the collective uses your NIL in the ways that we've agreed. But then what about all the brands that are going to be using your NIL in these ways? What sort of protections do you have that they're going to do what you're thinking they, they can do? So drafting language in there to make sure that you're protected as against the way third parties are going to use your, your NIL is really important. Um, and then also approval rights. Like, do you get to choose what third parties the collective will license your NIL to. Um, and that could be good if you, you know, enter into a deal, an exclusive agreement with a brand, and then the collective wants you to do a deal with a competitive brand. So you want to make sure that you're not um, allowing opportunities like that for yourself. Um, understanding the payment structure. So you just want to make sure that you understand when you're going to get paid, that you payments not tied to specific athletic performance uh, metrics and it's not tied to specific athletic events is really important. Um, and then, you know, these are new companies. They haven't been around for a ton of time. They're not, we don't know, you know, how they all generate their revenue. So they might not all be solvent for very long. And, you know, you might have one collective replace another collective. So again, like payment structures, when are you going to get paid? How are you going to get paid if the collective goes away and some other collective replaces it? So understanding things like that are, are challenging. And then termination, it, sh it should be sort of um, not too complicated to get out of the deal. I mean, this is especially the case if an athlete chooses to enter the transfer portal and go from one school to another school and then be um, in a position where they want to sign with another collective that's related to the new institution that they might be attending. Um, and then just dispute resolution. Again, that's important for all kinds of contracts that you're going to enter into just to make sure you understand um, how that's going to work. Anything else we missed that you wanted to touch upon? I think the only other thing that I would say in terms of trying to find an agent is is really, you know, you you have to pick somebody who is who you gel with, that you trust, that you really think is going to go out and always have your best interest in mind and is not just going to be thinking about their own bottom line. You want to make some sure somebody is really well respected because negotiations are tough. And it's often the people that have the best relationships with people in the industry that can get the best deals for their clients. And at the end of the day, you want somebody who is an advocate. So they, you know, maybe they don't take no an answer every single time. They really will try to fight to make sure that you get what, what is fair, both legally and on the business side. So just some things to think about when, when you're thinking about like the, the type of person that you want to work with. 